Well, this afternoon I'm going to teach a small group again. I'm doing this for free, as in my stage of life now. Um, being tied down and working for small amounts of money with the lessons is uh, more stress than worth, I think. And although I'm still offering private lessons individually, um, for these groups of local friends, I'm just saying, come along on a Friday, I'll have a social and I'll do some teaching. And uh, what I'm going to do here is work on these photographs of uh, the mill that I took the other day that you saw on the film. I've done a little bit of masking already just to show the masking fluid. And run through all of the brushes basically and on two bits of paper I'm going to do textures as we go along and let them try that. If they want to have a go at this as well they can. We've only got two hours. Um, and I'm going to show all the different brushes and how they work and the textures and sponges and so on. And then use each texture on here just to give them an idea of how they can be used. I could get away with just one or two brushes on this easily, but um, in this case I want to show them the variety of brushes and uh, how we can achieve these effects and get this atmosphere by using these techniques. Are we ready? Right, what I'm going to do today is we'll start off with a folder of past work. Um, uh, it's quite fun, so I want to give you the diversity of work, the sort of things we can do with different mediums and materials. Then I'm going to move into the other room, and we'll all get hands on, and you've got a choice of simply making marks and enjoying the different brushes, not being stressed at all, or pushing yourselves a little and having a go at the painting and the brush marks, because I should try to work, depending on the time we get, so we'll just see how far we get, but we're going to have some fun anyway. As the, uh, once you've had an introduction to all of these ways and mediums and methods, then the lessons sort of get much more fluid and you do entirely what you want individually. So we won't be doing exercises all the time, we won't be setting something, you will just come and paint what you want to paint and it doesn't matter what medium or what method, I will just teach you individually. So we're not having the same thing. What I want to start off with, um, I've got this little piece here, I just realised they were here, but I did those when I was ten years old, so that's my, when my nine, nine or ten years old, so my first work from years past. Little one there, but this is just a bit of like plasterboard, but it's actually oil paint used quite thinly on board. So we're going to look at different ways we can. Obviously, well, oil paint has to be on, well, has to be on canvas or or hardboard or whatever. Now, when you're painting oil paint onto hardboard, you usually prime the smooth side of the hardboard with a couple of coats of emulsion. It can be coloured emulsion. It's quite nice using brown, for instance, or even black. But white emulsion, two coats. But don't use the rough side of the hardboard. It's actually the reverse to canvas. And amateurs think it looks like canvas, but it doesn't. It is the reverse to canvas, and it shows up on my eyes. Well, hardboard is quite good. MDF is good, just the same. So I mean, I'm talking about hardboard. There's, there's the rough side of hardboard. But this one's an acrylic, and we're talking tonal. We're going on later to how we can make colours look bright, by using a very limited palette. And all we've done here is used Rembrandt's colours, the earth colours of burnt sienna, yellow ochre, white, black, um, and just those few colours, well, the black and white makes the blue. The burnt sienna makes a red. The yellow ochre becomes almost lemon yellow. Can white make blue? Yeah, because of the colours that it's working with. It's one colour compared to another. So as we said last week, we talked about warm and cool. Yeah. Black and white with, uh, is fairly cool. But if we put some um, burnt sienna with, with or burnt umber, with the black and white, then it looks like black, it goes warmer, and the black and white looks cooler, so it's comparative. So we can use just a few colours, so subtly, and yet with great effect. Which means that we'll go on to the sort of the techniques of things, so I mean we'll go on then to say, well last week I talked about fluorescent bright coats, how can we do that without using fluorescent paint? By using other colours around it that make the red look brighter. So Constable used this bit of red in all his paintings to make the greens come out, if we put greens or cool colours all around that red, the red's going to shine out. So we can use the chemistry of colours. Hello, somebody else just to write. <laughs> we can use the chemistry of colours. So on this one I was just discussing how we used a very limited palette. And we talked the other week about warm and cool colours. Now, going on to other mediums then. Um, Watercolour techniques you're probably quite, quite well aware of, but just we'll look at a few watercolour techniques in this first of all. The whites in this are not white paint, they're lifted out. Perspective. Linear perspective is the use of lines going in. So if we now look at a, a linear one, so we've got warm, cool, cool, going back there. The opposite, of course, is when we have a sunset, where you'll have 
cool in the foreground and warm in the background. Again, wet into wet, and then glazes over the top. Now, a glaze is a wash. A wash is a, a, just a wet colour over the surface. You can have a variegated wash, you can have a graduated wash of different colours. So much to take it in. Don't, don't even think to take it in. All I'm doing is introducing so many ways you're going to say, well, this is exciting, we're going to do all these different things we can pick up on later. Um, but a glaze is a wash over a dry, um, uh, over a dry wash, over a dry, so it's a glaze, in other words, it's a thinner, watercolour is transparent. Watercolour is made by very, very thin um, pigment, very, very fine pigment, and a little bit of gum arabic, which help binds it together. <laughs> You're not going to be a naughty girl, I'm just going to go at the back of the class, I've got you at the front, keep an eye on you. <laughs> 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 right, okay, leave that one there. That's the Just give it a little bit of fresh air for you. Now, there's a piece of sculpture in the other room, isn't there? No, you haven't seen it. Maybe you have. There's a girl, yeah? And the studies that I did for that, <coughs> working studies, again, it's China graph pencil. Now, you've no room for messing about with China graph pencil. You make a mistake, you've had it, you can't rub it out. I did that entire piece in there. There was enough information for me on these to do that. And it's minimal. Now remember when you're drawing, you should never you hardly ever well, very few times when you draw a tram line, an edge of an object is as important as the inside of the object. If you're going to draw a very broken object, you draw a very broken line. It's a very light edge, a very light line. No amount of shading will make a tram line drawing look three-dimensional, because you've ruined it with the hard outline already. Feel the outline as well as the so you see how I've, I've changed with the outline as well as minimal shading. Um, cross hatching, little pastel in uh, cross hatching. Cross hatching means you're going crisscrossing with the lines rather than just dots or rather than just um, shading or blocking and blending. You see the little marks going one across another. It's obviously glass, isn't it? But we don't have to paint. We're, we're doing artwork. We're not reproducing photographs. If that's what you want to do, fine. I'll help you do anything you want. But we're trying to take something beyond the photograph into art. And this is about watercolour. You couldn't do this with oils. The different things you do with oils. So what we want to do is choose the best, um, the best method and medium for the subject. So if we want a very dour Scottish landscape, then we can use limited palette watercolour coming down the paper stream. <laughs> um, little, little paper. Right again, um, China graph pencil and watercolour. It's quite interesting, but you know, just showing you different ways of working. We've seen very transparent ones, and stick and ink. Going back to college, it was about, uh, again, about nine to eight, somewhere I'll be about 17, eight, 17 I did this one. But you can get such lovely marks with just a stick and ink or fiber tip or whatever. And the idea is minimalism. Going back to that picture you saw earlier with the limited palette, this is one with pastels. But I've used a few more colours and just tinted in a little bit more strongly, just to give you an idea. And again, if we look at the same thing, where we're only using a couple of colours, so it's monochrome. And here we're just using the brown paper showing through, nice and fluid. The same thing on black paper, just with white chalk and a bit of charcoal. Another one. This time on glass paper. Glass paper is a very nice thing to work on. Glass paper uh, takes a lot of pastel though, and the trick with glass paper is always blend with the palm of your hand, never your fingertips, because it very quickly wears them down. Get sore. Watercolour, and again, China graph pencil. Uh -huh. Ways of working. The same theme, but it just shows you how many ways something can be interpreted. And finally, just a straightforward watercolour. So all of those different ways on one subject, very difficult to choose if you want to do, but good fun in all of those different ways. And then back to the rubber scrub technique and the one of those earlier ones, the model, you can see how we use the atmosphere of the rubbing and scrubbing to get the feet. Right, so that's all I'm going to do here basically, then we're going to the other room. We're actually going to look at all those different brushes and have some fun with them and see if you want to create a little painting. We've got all these brushes, we're now going to look at these different brushes and Explore with them. Uh, now, what I'm going to say to you is, I'm not charging for lessons, no, we've already discussed that. But if you want paper, there's a block of it over there, two sheets for a, a euro. Can't be bad, can it?
Okay, so if you want to play around today, then you can have a couple of sheets off there. You owe me a euro. The paints I won't even bother with. We don't have those free today. We'll just go on from there like that. Um, I've got a couple of brushes out here, and I've got some sponge there. Sea sponge, for those that weren't here the other week. Um, you can buy them quite cheaply off the internet as bags of different ones, or you can go to the seaside shop sometimes and buy them there. If you buy a sea sponge in an art shop, it costs an arm and a leg. If you get one like this, it's a lot cheaper. And you do want ones that have a nice, fine texturing on them like that, because it's that texturing that's so important. That's what you're going to actually use, this texturing here. There's a China graph pencil. China graph pencil is very useful because, as I say, it's waterproof. You don't have to sharpen it. You peel that bit of string down and peel off the paper when you're out in the field, and it's there immediately. So that's quite useful, especially for snow scenes and things, OK? I don't use black much in my paints. I'm an impressionist, therefore I believe that everything has colour, even white. Where there is light, there's colour. There'll never be pure white. There'll always be a little bit of colour from the sky or from the sun. Or from the... So we've got a yellow tint here from this light or whatever. So I would use um, a deep blue and a brown to make a black. If I want a grey, then I'll mix um, brown and blue to give a nice grey and so on. I'll hardly ever use black and white, but I do at times. I'm going to to show you. There are times in my more contemporary ones where I do use black, but not much. In that case, with those China graph pencils, I do. We've got a fan brush. Again, similar to the um, rake brush in that I can do the ends of trees. If I'm doing winter trees and branches, then these are great just to flick in all those little twigs at the end in winter time. They're good also for fir trees. You can use them that way around and paint all the fir tree branches look. You can imagine this I'm doing. It's almost a fir tree shape, isn't it? You can almost imagine I'm doing it. We've talked about the brushes that we're going to paint with. Now let's look at the surfaces we can paint on. That is papyrus. If you've ever seen papyrus, that's the original, so I'll pass that round. Then we've got some beautiful handmade Tibetan papers. We should have everything from sort of yak hair in them to, you know, these handmade papers. And imagine, you know, if you're doing gold leafing or something where you want to actually let the papers be seen. I'll let those be passed around as well. The textures in them, little bits of leaf in them at times, hair in them. And you can make your own papers, remember? You can just take old bits of paper, newspaper, whatever. You can put bleach into it to bleach it out. You can add things into your paper. So you can tear up little bits of newspaper, you can put it into a bin, you can use your soup blender into it, mix it all up into a sludge, you can put it onto the a silk screen, you can put it onto like a silk screen, flatten it out, roll the mixture out, dries out just like this. So you can make your own paper quite simply at home. And look at these gorgeous textures. So it's just not to be a hugely expensive item, you can actually make your own papers and put bits of dried leaf in and flower petals and all sorts. And then, as I say, what you do with them is up to you how you can show through, whether you, you use coloured pencils or bold leafing or coloured inks or how you want to go. This is a velvet paper. You see, I put a little bit of pastel on there just to show you. Very, very effective, especially for those doing commercial work of animal portraits and things. But you can imagine the soft effects on the velvet paper are very, um, well, a little bit twee, but a, a very commercially viable, shall we say. So, velvet paper. An ordinary ombres paper in pastel paper. Sorry. Now, when you're using pastel paper, use the smoother side, not the orange peel side. People think that's the texture. The bite is the same on both sides. And the orange peel side works against you. Unless you actually want an orange peel type texture or canvas texture, use the smoother side of the, of the pastel paper, not the orange peel side. There's another sheet of something similar with a deeper colour. I use ordinary hot pressed watercolour paper for most of my pastels uh, and water. You can mix pastels with water, we're going to be doing that later, it's great fun. Pastel and water uh, will, once pastel has been used as water, it's fixed. If you mix pastel with water under paper, it stays, it won't move. So you can put pastel over it afterwards and it won't smudge. So if we do our first couple of coats, just like painting with water, watercolour, to get the background colour so no paper showing, then we can put pastel on top. It's not that expensive. Um, but I love to work that way. Also, you can use acrylic inks onto the paper and then put pastel over the top of that to get very strong, bright colours. So much to take in, isn't there? He's lost over there. He's lost. <laughs> right, that's a, that's a hot press watercolour. Hot press is smooth. Hot press is smooth. Not is not either. And rough is what it says. You can get extra rough. There's a knot. So you've got hot press smooth. There's a knot. And here's the rough. You see the surface. So you imagine if you want a snowy surface, you'd want the rough, wouldn't you, to go across the surface to get that texture. 
But even the ordinary sugar paper is useful. You saw in there where I did that ballet dance on this ordinary thin black sugar paper. It works quite well. So that's our surfaces for um, mostly for pastel and for watercolour. Put this out, and they can be messy. I've, I've, I'm 50% for and 50% against these. This is the fine line masking fluid. And what happens is this top comes off here and there's a very fine needle that goes down inside. There's a needle in there that goes inside that to keep it clear. The problem I found is that um, sometimes it starts leaking around here and you're getting blobs and things covered in places. So uh, when you're using it, just rest it and you should go to... Here we are, look, you should just draw it. See how easy that is? Very little squeezing at all. It almost comes out on its own. Let's do it again for the camera. Resting the nozzle on and just letting it come out almost by its own weight. Just the very slightest squeeze. Now, when you put them back in again, be very careful. You've got to get that smack in the middle. At least that's working all right. Push it down and then twisting it. And just do it up. Now, I've used that on this picture. I've drawn it out very loosely. You don't need lots of detail for a drawing like this. We're going to work within it. <laughs> I'm using the china puppets, otherwise I thought it was only a couple of pencils. Yeah. Well, we can just, just hang on whilst, whilst, whilst we're working. Right, so what I'm going to do first is use the wash brush and I want to look at background... Where am I, there? I want to look at the background, um, walls, all of this business here. Dark things are going to come last. We're looking at the lights first, so that's why we've done these. We're going to leave this light behind. I'm going to use a bit of sponge here to get the effect in here, the text here. A little bit of dry brush work on there. So a fairly stiff brush and sponge there. Here it's much softer in reflection, so definitely a soft brush there. Here I could use um, a stippling brush or maybe a hake brush to get those effects. Here we're going to use a little square brush. I've got one here. That's just the right size. For painting a square hole, you want a square brush. You're painting a round hole, you want a round brush. It's fairly obvious, isn't it? But I can paint all of these little windows like just by going dab, 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 like that in a moment. Anyway, we're going to make a start. So I'm going to start just with um, a wash brush first of all and I just put them into the palette here and they go dry and they go solid. So it's exactly the same as the paints that are used in those little blocks you can buy but I can just refill these as I want so I prefer it this way. So I'm putting a little bit of water just onto these first of all. Just to soften them at the surface. Now I'll give that just a minute or so and it doesn't take much of a brush to move them. Can you all see that bit of paper from there? Yeah? yeah? Right. What I'm going to do is just show you this business about dropping colour in and how we can use soft brushes. <coughs> right, that's um, raw sienna there. Take a little bit of that raw sienna and using it quite thinly, I'm going to drop it down here. I'm going to put a little bit of water just here, clean water, and look how that blends in. So that's wet next to wet, okay? This is wet next to dry, a harder edge. So we can blend in with clean water any time we want, and we can lift out any time we want. So if I dry that brush off, I can come back here and I can lift out, so I could have sun's rays coming through here. So we put the paint on, and now I can lift out. I want to go around that further, I can start to put some blue sky into there. We've got wet here, let's put wet next to wet again. I'll take some of this co um, cobalt blue and let that just come in. And you see how one colour blends into another there. And bring some of that through here, wet into wet. You get these lovely soft effects. Clean and on the, on the paper. And I can make it thicker or thinner. So I'm putting more paint in or less paint in as I go along. We get a lovely effect like that. So that's wet into wet and wet next to wet and lifting out. It talks about making a grey. I'll take some blue and a little bit of brown about sienna there, and it will give me quite a nice grey. I get a nice blue-grey, you see. So we're leaving light areas behind of a cloud. I can go darker and darker, and I can go stronger and stronger into here. While it's still wet, I can keep painting. I don't have to stop. I can drop into lovely deep colours whenever I want, but that's wetting to wet. Lovely effects, yeah? And wet next to wet. We can let that dry, and when it's dry we can paint a layer over the top to make it stronger. Also, if I want to get an effect of, um, I'll do it right in front of you here, of rain coming down, if we tilt the paper, we can get this paint to go any direction we want by tilting it, which is quite fun as well. So you know an iris is, you get that lovely purple blues going, don't you? Mm -hmm. 
we put the yellow on, you can just drop in wet into wet in one small area, very controlled, the purple next to the yellow, and we can get those that lovely mottled effect of the iris like that. So that's wet into wet and wet next to wet. Then there's a darker area there, so I'm going to drop that wet into wet straight away there with this brush still. So it's a much, much deeper, warmer dark there. Drop it wet into wet over in England, but I'll just see if I can get to this hake's a bit too big, but what I want to do is just show you how you can use the texture of a hake in the same sort of way, you see. It's a smooth brush, but because I've kept it dry, so we've got different textures happening already with just, just these few items. So, <coughs> so we use the fan brush to just tickle in the end of those branches. Back to this one again. Now, I talked earlier about using square brushes for square pegs. Let's take this lovely dark colour again. And look at these windows. Probably the only area where I'm going to actually be detailed at all. But I can now come down and I can put all my little windows in, look. Leaving the whites in between. If I didn't better bother counting them, I'm just going to come down. Slightly blue tint, I think. Oh, this is a furry brush. Now, you wouldn't be able to paint a fine line with this one. I'll show you why. You see? So very useful again, but this little furry brush. If I want to paint a fine line, which I can't do with that, I'm going to need an ordinary round brush. You probably won't realise just how far I've got with that, because actually it's probably got further than you think. Now, here, it's gone dry. So now I can start to paint some details into here. I'm just going to indicate these background. So there's going to be plenty of time for you to explore and play in a minute and catch up with me. Quick and easy as that. I'll bring that tree through there later. Now I'll go back to this bit. And I'm going to use the edge of the brush here for the edge of the waterfall. And just come over the edge of that waterfall using the edge of the brush. Like that. And just coming along the top of the water here to get the feeling of... Now we're going on the horizontal. We've done the verticals, now I'm on my horizontals. You can see the feeling of water even coming there. The reflection's just starting, can't you? I'm going to put in some aureolin. Now these yellows look the same, don't they? But they're not. This is lemon yellow, which is opaque. So if I wanted to paint something over the top of something else, I made a mistake. I could use opaque paint. It wouldn't be as translucent, it wouldn't be as transparent, it wouldn't be as fresh. But it would still work. So if I take some of that and paint it over the top of that, look, you see it paints it right out, doesn't it? But if I take some of this one, which is aureolin yellow, which is a much nicer sort of lemon yellow, put that over the top, it's transparent, look. I'm going to use that, first of all, for these greens. And come in here with this lemon yellow all the way through here, up into here, because I'm going to make my green actually on the paper rather than mix it. Comes all the way up through that tree there, out here, right through here, through there. So I'm, I'm planning ahead. Watercolour is very much like a battle. Watercolour, you've got to plan your battle ahead to win. You've got to know where you're going to need your lights and your darks. Some of that reflecting down into here, some of that yellow's coming through into the, the water a little bit in places here, certainly coming into the background there. Now if I put in, if I take my oil in yellow and I add a little bit of uh, cerulean to it, I get an immediate lovely fresh green look. So I'm going to take some of that cerulean now, blue, my cool blue, and drop it in here, leaving those little bits of light leaf from the sunshine shining through. I'll do a stronger still. I could mix stronger greens. Any blue and any yellow will give me different greens. The cooler the blue, the cooler the yellow, the cooler the green. So if I use a brownie green, if I use a, br so a brownie um, yellow or an, an, and a stronger blue, I'm going to get a much stronger. So let's do an example of that just to show you. If I take some of that colour, so lovely and loose, and we've got those different textures going on by using those different ways of working. Again, if I want it darker now, like these bits here, it's dry, I can now go back and I can paint in these strong shadows. Right, now for the fun bit. We can virtually finish this painting in one, in one whack now. We want all of these lovely dark trees in. 
So what colour do you reckon, Sue, I'll need to make something like those dark trees? It's a warm browny green, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So what should we use then? Should we take this one? Look, this is the burnt sienna. It's a lovely colour. That one really cool, very dark. We'll take a bit of the, this is called Prussian blue, it's extremely dark blue, it's very, very strong. It's a bit more brown, do you think? Something like, about that, yeah? Now, these branches, let's really go in there. A bit more, a bit more warmth. So yeah, see how thickly I'm using the medium now? Come in there and I just paint these straight in, using the tip of the brush. Go down through here. The one that's quite dark. We've got this lovely dark tree here, put a bit more warmth into that. If that's dry enough, which I hope it is, I should be able to paint that through virtually in one go. Straight down through. Put a bit more warmth into it again. So we've got our light shining behind. But so now when I've finished here, you can go ahead and draw, you can have a go at this, or you can just play with those different brushes on your other bit of paper and just get the feel of it. A bit of turquoise, look at this lovely turquoise, let's really look for colour, look how much turquoise there is going on in there, really look for these colours. I'm going to stop in a minute because I've gone far enough as a demonstration just to show you. And we'll look at this away from this harsh light, we'll look at it just over there in a minute. And you know, then I'd work into more and more detail, um, but we should start to get the effect of... That's it, Leslie. Paint those trees right down to the bottom where they go. All the dark areas now, paint the dark areas out.